Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, uh, it is an honor to be here. I was asked by an Israeli reporter last night, um, what was it like to receive this invitation? And the only answer I could come up with is, imagine a working class Irish Catholic kid from America comes to a Jewish state to talk about LGBT rights, how much, how much the world has changed. It is, um, again, an honor to be here. I want to acknowledge folks who are here from Seattle. There's a group that have been traveling around uh, with me all week. Uh, they're here. I want to acknowledge them. I want to acknowledge Marcia, Marcia Botzer, who is a pioneer on transgender issues. <clears throat> And I want, to, uh, I want to introduce to you somebody I have spent uh, 24 years with and have been married to for two years legally, and that's my husband, Michael Shiozaki. <laughs> this has um, been our first trip to Israel, and it has been amazing. Uh, whether it was meeting with members of the Knesset, whether it was going to Vod Rasham, whether it was visiting the Western Wall, or spending time in the West Bank visiting with students uh, who hope uh, that their future will be better than the present. And of course, coming here to Tel Aviv and participating in tomorrow's parade is also just going to be a significant thing. Let me say something about my remarks. I'm going to talk about tra strategy. I'm going to talk about politics. But I'm an American, and I'm going to talk about it from an American perspective. Um, my perspective is not the perspective of everyone in this room. <clears throat> And I'm not here to tell you what is best for you and your country or the other countries here, uh, but just to share um, our experience as we have struggled for equality in my state. Um, my husband is uh, the grandchild of immigrants from Japan. I'm the grandchild of immigrants from Ireland. We are both native Washingtonians. Uh, we, we are unusual in our own state in that we are natives who actually still live there. Most of the state is from somewhere else. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we have had uh, an incredible opportunity and wonderful advantages because of where we live. We also have faced challenges um, at, in a country where race remains an issue and we, rem and we are an interracial couple. I think that uh, Seattle is an incredible city. We have the largest gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender business organization, the largest NGO in our city, and of course, as, as, uh, with, because of Marsha Botzer, the oldest transgender service organization in the United States. Later this month, <laughs> later this month, we will have a very large, one of the largest pride parades in the United States, but given the last speech, I'm not gonna mention numbers. <laughs> um, let me begin my remarks by saying that each of us, as we try and work for equality, for our community come from the same place. We each share that same journey that started in isolation and became one of self-awareness, eventually of self-acceptance, and hopefully one that allowed us to build families and join the community that we see here today. I think that's important to remember because I think that our cause is so unique and our reality is so rare. We are everywhere. We are in every community. And I think that uniqueness provides us with an opportunity, not just to move forward the fight for equality for our own community, but to build bridges between communities that are in conflict and to move other movements of liberation forward. My state, as I mentioned, has had some pretty progressive things happen. We have full, we passed in 06 after a 29 year struggle in our state legislature, and I, I was happy to lead the, the last few years of that. We passed full civil rights, ending discrimination in employment and housing and financial transactions. We were one of the first states, we were one of the first states to fully recognize and protect transgender people from discrimination. We were, we were the first state by vote of the legislature in 2012 to overturn a DOMA law and one of the first states by a vote of the people to pass marriage equality for all of its citizens. But, uh, but our journey was not easy, and it had many reversals, and it took a very long time. In my early years in the legislature, I sat there as my colleagues passed the Defense of Marriage Act. I watched our civil rights legislation 
fail by one vote. The reversals were significant. But I believe the things I can share with you, hope and perseverance, is what made a difference. We faced a right-wing majority at that time. The religious right blocked our way in every turn and we're in the ascendancy. We as a community were fractured and fragmented. We didn't have the support according to the polls and the situation was so bleak that members of our community were losing faith in their leaders and quite honestly in me. How did we change things? Because believe me, the days were dark. First of all, we realized that we needed to build a movement, in many ways rebuild a movement, that focused first on our cause, focused on our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender brothers and sisters, first and only. That the only way we could be in coalition with other organizations, whether progressive organizations on the left or allies across the spectrum, first meant that we needed to be strong. If the HIV AIDS crisis taught us anything, we cannot rely on others. We can only rely first on ourselves alone. And if we do not understand what we need, others will not be able to assist us as allies. Secondly, once we are strong and once we felt we were in a strong position, we realized that collaboration and coalition was important. First, collaboration and coalition had to happen internally within the LGBT community, and given the infighting, I wasn't sure that was gonna happen because sometimes in the progressive or left movement, folks often think that building coalition is just hanging out with people like yourself. Building coalitions is actually about getting together with people who are not like yourself. So that became our challenge first internally, <laughs> and it became our challenge externally. We needed, there were not enough of us. We are not big enough in our state, in any state in the United States, to actually make change happen alone. So we had to build coalitions. Those included early on was the labor community, included early on the Jewish American community in my state and in my city. And I'm so glad that those leaders decided to join us here today. Thank you very much. But we needed to build beyond just progressive movements. It meant doing something that wasn't always easy for my community at the time. It meant engaging with the business community and developing business allies. It meant engaging and finding people in religious communities who would absolutely support us. We were able to do both. And that engagement really made all the difference. We won the civil rights bill by a single vote after we lost it by a single vote. And we won it because a Republican senator by the name of Bill Finkbeiner was willing to stand up and step down as a leader of his majority party so that he could vote for this bill. If we had not built those bridges, if we had not engaged with Republicans as well as Democrats, that bill would not have been passed, marriage equality would not have been passed in our state, and I suspect I would not be standing here today. One of the ways we were able to change Republican minds was because we changed business minds. Companies such as Microsoft stood with us, it took them a while to get there, but they stood with us. And when they stood with us, they were able to bring along uh, business Republicans. The next thing, number three, was our ability to talk about who we were as a community. And we realized that too often we were talking about our community and ourselves as victims. And if I think there's anything I learned from my own immigrant grandparents uh, who had a very difficult time coming to the United States uh, is that being a victim gets you nowhere. And so we actually decided that we need to talk about who we were, that we were teachers, that we were employers, that we owned businesses, that we were employees, that we were making a difference in the economy, that we were, we were the sisters, the brothers, the parents of other people in our community. And it was by telling the value added, to use a very American phrase, that, that value added business concept, but by talking about us as strong members of a community that made a community more vibrant, really, really made the difference. And let me tell you how it made the difference. The 25th vote on the marriage bill, I just talked about the civil rights bill, but the 25th vote, and we needed 25 votes to pass it in the state Senate. The 25th vote came from a conservative woman who had actually voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, a Democrat. It was her grandchildren who convinced her that she needed to change her mind. She voted Senator Mary Margaret Haugen she voted for the marriage bill. It passed, she lost her election. 
we change minds. And we change minds because we were engaged with somebody who actually voted against us. So um, I want you to remember that name, um, Mary Margaret Haugen, because there are people like her in all of our countries who uh, stand up for us and never get recognized. I realize that this is a moment of great joy. It is also a moment of great fear. We see incredible victories around the world. And, and let me say something. Ireland would not have happened. When I used to visit Ireland as a teenager and throughout my life, the Ireland that, that I knew, a uh, very conservative religious Ireland, uh, would not have been the place I would have chosen that would have been the first country in the world to pass marriage equality. But the Irish actually stayed engaged with it, each other. They actually change hearts and minds, just like I said we did in Washington State. And despite, and despite the dynamics of Ireland, Ireland stepped forward and is, change, and is changing the world as a result of that. So for my grandparents' country, I do want to do a call out for Ireland as well. <laughs> but you know, we, we see victories, but we also see reversals. We see Ireland passing, passing marriage equality, and we see our fellow brothers and sisters being beheaded and sent to prison in other countries. So the challenge before us is really about hope and perseverance. In the darkest days that we were, went through in my state, when the religious right was, was winning and we were losing, it really was about hope and perseverance. And when I talk to young people today, not in my own state, but around the country, remember a good part of my country offers nothing to our members of our community, there is a sense of, of losing hope and losing, and losing um, hope that the future can change. I think it's so important that all of us remember that we are that hope. And particularly young people can offer us the idealism that can change situations when we are struggling to change situations. There, and I want to tell you a story. I met a woman uh, who died just a few days ago, uh, Magda Schulman. She, I, I just come back from a visit to Auschwitz, uh, which was one of the worst experience I'd ever had. It changed me in many, many ways. It's one of the reasons I decided to come to Israel uh, today. Uh, but I was not in a very good place about what it said about humanity after that visit. Magda told a story. She had been liberated from Auschwitz at 19. And the day she was liberated, she was from uh, Hungary. The day she was liberated, she met an uh, 18-year-old from Greece. They didn't speak any language in common, but she said they knew one word, and she did this, rendezvous. And out of the worst situation imaginable, that rendezvous became a hopeful family and a major contributor to the community in Seattle. I think as we face these reversals, we must remember that we are the chance to have our own moments of rendezvous. And we can only have those moments of rendezvous if we're willing to see a situation as tense as a discussion around pinkwashing as actually an opportunity for us to come back together as a community. Because if we do not come back together as a community, then the young people that we heard about from the Member of Parliament in Sweden and the young people who are homeless on the streets of Seattle, our young people will not have a future. So our challenge is, despite our debates and despite our disagreements, that we must be unified. We must have our rendezvous moment here in the state of Israel and in the United States and across the globe. I want to diverge just a moment from the discussion, maybe not too much, but the discussion of, of uh, the criticism I received for coming to this conference and visiting the state of Israel. I am a liberal uh, Democrat. Um, I am on the left of my party. Sometimes I think I'm moderate, but I think after uh, having the first city to pass a minimum wage to $15 an hour in my country, <laughs> that I think the business community thinks that I am a far leftist. But anyway, <laughs> the criticism is because in college I was a leader of the movement to boycott and divest from South Africa because I imposed a traveling ban on city employees when the state of and Indiana quickly passed a law that took us back, not just for gay rights, but took us back before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in my country. Um, I think this obscured uh, in a somewhat simplistic uh, approach to our approach to issues of, of oppression and justice. It ignored the fact that I also reached out with Republicans, built relationships with people who constantly voted against me, um, that there is a, not a one-size-fits-all when we're trying to deal with issues as complex 
and as fraught with, with uh, issues of injustice as the ones that you're dealing with in these lands. What worries me is, you know, any time we ha that we are seem on the left to be going to a place of ideology when it comes to this issue, and if anything that we learn from the 20th century, the more perfect the ideology, the more terrible the results. I don't believe that we as a community can al allow ourselves to be divided along these ways. Make no mistake, I disagree with um, the policies of your Prime Minister and I agree with President Obama and I agree with many of the points that the proponents of the boycott make. My problem is I don't believe that the remedy is appropriate. In addition, I don't believe the Christian West, let me put it a different way, the Christian West needs to think very, very seriously before it decides to use the strategy that physically or otherwise isolates Jews. It comes... It comes too close to our historic treatment of Jews over a 2,000 year period. But despite the disagreements I have with those who, who propose that strategy, I really do think we need to distinguish the people who make up this strategy. There are people, who, people whose motivations are not good. But there's a whole lot of young people in my country who are acting out of a sense of justice. I wish, though, that they would take an opportunity and not boycott, but engage. My trip to Israel has been one of the most My trip, to, my trip to Israel and to what I hope someday is a Palestinian state has been one of the most amazing trips I've had. I have learned about complexities that I never knew existed, complexities within complexities. I would encourage those who question the policies in this country and the issues in Palestine to come here, the West Bank, the future Palestinian state, to come here and talk to folks. You, people will be very excited by what they hear. They will be very frustrated, as I have been, by what I've heard. At times, they will be very angry. But I think that we will come up with a different, a different approach, and that's engagement. To my Israeli friends and, and community members here, I, I, I dare not give you advice on what to do in, in, in your own country. After all, I come from a city that was named after an American, Native American Indian chief. Uh, the members of his tribe mostly do not live on the lands of my city. I come from a place, my family comes from a place in Northern Ireland, where, and my, I'm related to both sides of that divide, where one part of my family uh, believes that it is their country because they have been there longer than my country, the United States, has existed. And on the other side of my family, they view those people as living on lands that have been historically theirs. So I am not here to offer you advice, but I do have one thought. The students that I met on the West Bank were truly some of the most amazing young people I have met. They were educated, they were hopeful, they believe that there is a solution that they can live with the state of Israel, but they are absolutely frustrated because despite their education, they are trapped and they have no job opportunities. If there's one thing I would suggest, it is maybe focusing on those young people. And these were not people who were particularly helpful when I asked them about LGBT issues, but despite that, Focusing on these young people, providing opportunities for them, the education they have, the English that they speak, to actually work, I think may be one of the threads that leads to resolution of the challenges that you face. And again, I don't mean to preach um, to folks uh, in another country. So in closing, let me say several things. Um, this has been again, an amazing experience. The opportunity to understand your issues as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in Israel has been one that has really influenced and changed me. As somebody who uh, comes from a different country and has had a different experience in some ways because our countries are different, our cultures are different, I hope you are able to understand that I truly do believe that engagement makes a difference that perseverance over many years makes a difference, that collaboration with each other makes a difference if we can work together even though we disagree, that building coalitions can make a difference, and that if we do that, I believe we can forward the cause for equality for our communities and other communities in both of our lands and in nations around the world. In, in ending, let me quote the late Robert Kennedy who went to South Africa 
uh, shortly before he was assassinated. And I evidently did not put that quote in my speech, but he basically said, he said, each time a person stands up for an ideal and strikes out against it, uh, injustice, that person builds a tiny ripple of hope. And those tiny ripple of hopes can create the biggest wave that can knock down any wall of injustice and oppression. I believe our community united can knock down our walls of justice, injustice and oppression, but can knock wall down other walls of injustice and oppression for other people across this globe. Congratulations on your 40th anniversary. Thank you very much for this invitation.